Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. Happy April and also welcome to Q2. Hope folks are doing well. We've got some good updates and demos to share today from the team. So let's hop on in. And on to Metasploit framework activity. From our research team, Spencer McIntyre will be walking us through the latest and greatest with Metasploit framework. Spencer? Thanks, Pierce. <clears throat> All right, we have a lot of new modules uh, to go over this week. Uh, I am very excited, it should be a good round of demos. Uh, first up, uh, this made quite a splash this year. We had uh, three modules actually submitted that all targeted the series of vulnerabilities that came out targeting Microsoft Exchange. Um, those were all called the proxy logon modules. So uh, we're going to have a, have a great demo of these uh, by Christoph here in a moment. Uh, the vulnerabilities, I believe, were originally found by Gray Order and Orm Sai, and they were added into Metasploit by Michaela. So huge thanks to uh, that community contributor for uh, the massive effort to get these three modules targeting this really high profile vulnerability into Metasploit. Uh, so huge thanks to them. Very, very exciting. But we have a scanner that will check for the vulnerability an exploit module that will actually leverage the vulnerability to obtain remote code execution, and an auxiliary module that will allow you to dump some information, including mailboxes and contact information from the remote exchange server. Um, so pretty excited about all that content. Uh, in addition to that, uh, by our own William Boo, Grant Wilcox, and an external uh, contributor or researcher, uh, Michaela K Kulipa Chikov, um, we have VMware View Planner Unauthenticated Log File Upload, RCE. Uh, so another remote code execution vulnerability. Uh, William Vu has been hard at work and also brought to us another uh, remote code execution vulnerability, this time in Advantech iView. Um, this is an unauthenticated remote code execution. Um, what's nice about this vulnerability is that uh, William Vu also found uh, the vulnerability and uh, we went through the disclosure process and then now we have the uh, exploit module in Metasploit. So that one's pretty great. So again, thanks to uh, Mr. William Vu. And uh, we also have a Fortilogger um, arbitrary file uh, upload exploit uh, brought to us by a community contributor of uh, Birkin Err. If we can go to the, uh, the next slide, uh, we have even more uh, module content. Um, we have the Win32K console control offset confusion. Uh, this was originally exploited in the wild uh, by Bitter APT. Um, in Q4 of 2020 and was patched by Microsoft in uh, February of this year. Um, the researchers listed um, did a fantastic and extremely detailed write-up, and then I myself uh, converted the module over into a uh, Metasploit exploit module, and we will have a demonstration of this uh, later as well. Uh, community contributor uh, Dmitry Chastovin um, and Pablo Artuso, Vladimir Ivanov, and Von uh, Gunar uh, brought to us the SAP Solutions Manager Remote Unauthorized OS Commands Execution. Uh, so these were a couple of uh, SAP modules uh, targeting a vulnerability uh, from 2020 in SAP software. Uh, community contributor Eric Winter brought to us a new Nagios XI scanner to, uh, to identify vulnerabilities in Nagios systems. Uh, Eric Winter has been working on quite a bit of Nagios content and uh, really improving the framework's coverage for that platform. Uh, we have an F5 I control REST unauthenticated SSRF token generation. Uh, it was remote code execution uh, by William Vu and Rich Warren. Uh, so this is another server-side request forgery similar to proxy logon, which is kind of interesting because it seems like we're seeing an uptick in uh, that class of vulnerabilities. Uh, so that's some great content that was added. Uh, Sophos Lab uh, offensive security team uh, brought to us another uh, Windows Exchange Server mailboxes uh, auxiliary modules. So that way we can uh, fetch that information. And then we have a Salt Stack Salt API unauthenticated RCE uh, that was added to Metasploit by our own Christophe de la Fuente uh, based on uh, the research uh, by external um, researchers Alexei uh, Seymour. And uh, we have uh, quite a few uh, enhancements and features. Uh, our own Jeffrey Martin improved the Zite work loader to ensure only one instance exists at a time. Uh, Arch Cloud Labs updated the Avast memory dump module with an additional path to check so we can identify uh, additional installations 
of Avast. Uh, community contributor Pinport80 updated the search command output so it can be sorted by a number of columns in both ascending and descending order, which is a really nice improvement. Uh, Pinport80 also updated the tools and exploits uh, all of the scripts under that subdirectory to handle interrupts gracefully. So when a user is running a command that takes a while and they hit control C, um, it'll print out a error message instead of a stack trace, which is very nice. Our own Alan David Foster added the time command to MSF console, which will be useful to allow developers to measure how long command execution takes, which is useful for profiling. Um, if you notice the trend here, we're seeing quite a few uh, efforts to sort of speed up things in Metasploit and try to get the um, performance improvements, uh, which leads us right into uh, Christopher Greenlease, who improved the performance of various show commands, speeding that up. Uh, community contributor uh, Michaela also updated the proxy log on RCE um, to utilize an RPC request to identify the backend server's uh, fully qualified domain name. So during the course of exploiting this vulnerability, you need that piece of information. So he updated the module to utilize a different technique in order to identify it. That's a little bit more, a little bit more reliable. And our own Shelby Pace updated the uh, metal implementation of Meterpreter, which powers uh, the Linux Meterpreter, and added in the search command to it. And we'll have a demo of that in a little bit. Uh, in addition to that, we had a number of bugs that were fixed. Uh, Christopher Greenlee's fixed deprecated uses of the get host by name. I believe this was part of ongoing efforts to uh, move up into Ruby uh, 3.0. Uh, so that's fantastic. Uh, Dean Welch fixed the on session open uh, event, which was depended on by certain plugins and was breaking them when they required functionality, uh, such as the auto add route plugin. Uh, Christopher Greenlees also updated the SSH login public key module to support a specific path and improve some of the error handling in there. So some nice improvements to that module. Uh, our own Alan David Foster updated the Apache ActiveMQ upload JSP exploit to work on systems that are running Java version 8. Community contributor Frederico updated the FileZilla client cred to fix an encoding error that would be found when it was processing the data. Uh, community contributor B. Coles fixed a broken check in method in the Netgear R6700 password reset module that was, I believe it was causing uh, false negatives uh, to show up. Uh, Alan David Foster also fixed a bug in the MSF console search commands highlighting where under certain conditions the highlighting would go awry. Uh, uh, Tim WR fixed a bug in the download command uh, that would be triggered when uh, the path contained UTF-8 characters and was breaking. And uh, Dean Welch also fixed the SMB relay model to utilize the correct SMB client backend. I've got a couple of more. Uh, I myself fixed an issue with the vhost option that it would be incorrect under certain conditions when you're scanning uh, multiple systems targeting uh, HTTP. Uh, Christopher Greenlees also updated the next post connect login function to handle the at symbol in passwords. We common for things like, uh, like email addresses, something along those lines. Ryan Puller also updated the proxy log on RCE module to run the payload exactly once, uh, which is a fantastic improvement to this exploit, which was seeing a lot of work. Um, in our demo, um, we actually have this issue, so the payload will run twice, but uh, this community contributor has already uh, seen fit to address that uh, issue. So you only get exactly uh, one instance of it running, which is fantastic. And finally, I myself fixed a bug in the Python interpreter's DNS uh, resolve function that was preventing the resolve command uh, from the interpreter uh, from working. So that was, uh, that was quite a bit. And as always, you can keep up with the latest and greatest uh, from the Metasploit weekly wrap up that is published every week to blog.rapid7.com. Uh, so an absolutely huge thanks to all of the community contributors and all the community members that helped uh, get all of that wonderful content in over the past couple of weeks. Those some fantastic enhancements and bug fixes and great module content. So thank you all. And with that, I think we are ready to start the demo. So first up is going to be Christoph. He is going to show us the SaltStack API RCE module. Christoph, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you, Spencer. Um, so SaltStack is an event-driven IT automation, a remote task execution, and configuration management software. Uh, so this exploit module allows to execute commands remotely on the master server as the root user. So it leverages an authentication bypass and directory traversal vulnerabilities in the REST API to get 
arbitrary write as root on the master server. So to achieve remote code execution, it takes advantage of a maintenance process check that is executed every 60 seconds by the salt master service. This automatic job reloads and executes all the grains on the master, including custom grain module in the extension module directory. So uh, the grains is uh, uh, a piece of information that uh, 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 provides information about underlying system. And it's uh, the cool thing that it can be customized with Python scripts. So what this module does is uh, actually first exploits the arbitrary file write as root and simply creates a Python script in the extension model directory and just waits for it to be executed. So the time interval is set to 60 seconds by default, but uh, it can be changed in the master configuration file with the loop interval option. Right. So note that uh, the administrator can execute commands locally on the master. And in this case, the, man the, the, the man maintenance process, sorry, uh, the maintenance process check will also be triggered. So this is another way to trigger this payload. So please, can you go ahead and, and start the video? It's pretty quick. So that's why I explained everything before. <laughs> it has been fixed in the packages 3000.8, 3000.8, uh, 3001.6 and 3002.5. So the options are uh, the basic options of the remote host, local host for the payload, and also the location of the extension module directory where the Python script will be written. Uh, this is set to the default value. So I don't think you will need to change this unless the administrator change it in the configuration file. And uh, yeah, we have different targets available. The Unix command and Linux dropper, we're gonna use the default one, the Linux dropper to get a metadata session. And here we go. Note that this module tries to clean up itself by deleting the Python script and all the files are generated during the execution. Here we go, we're root. Awesome, thank you, Christoph. I believe you are up again uh, with the highly anticipated Exchange Proxy Logon uh, series of demos. You yes. ready? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I will demo three models uh, from, uh, originally from the community contributor, Mick Halley. Um, <clears throat> so they exploit two Microsoft Exchange server vulnerabilities patched in uh, March out of band security updates. Um, so please, uh, can you go ahead and start the video? Right, so we are gonna use uh, uh, an exchange server. We already have some emails and uh, attachment here. And uh, the first module is um, uh, a scanner module that uh, simply checks if the target is vulnerable to pre oath server side request forgery, the CVE 2021-26855. So it's pretty simple. You just have to set the remote host and it will tell if the target is vulnerable or not. Right. So the result is also stored in the database. And like every scanner model, you can use an IP range or file with a list of IPs. This is very useful to scan a set of hosts in just one go. Right. So the Next module is, uh, the, the next module dumps mailbox in uh, for a given email address, including emails, attachments, and contact information. It exploits the same server-side request forgery vulnerability. And the options are pretty much the same. The, you have to set the email address you want to dump. So here is the email address I have set up. You can also specify the folder you want to dump, for example, inbox, send items, draft, etc. So here the action is set to dump emails from inbox only. So as you can see, emails are downloaded, including attachments. And everything is saved to the loot and referenced in the database. The yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's 
pretty cool module. And you have, it also downloads, so uh, attachment. Here we have a PDF, which is here, uh, and you can access it directly from the loot. We're gonna check, for example, this file and look at its content. Right, so we have the raw email from this uh, email, from this user mailbox, which is uh, this email. Right, so uh, let's try now with another action option to dump contact information. So this one, and uh, it's gonna work pretty much the same way. Uh, you will have now contact information in files uh, in the loop. So we just have one contact for this user, but as you can see, it dumps everything. And it's also saved uh, to the loot. So that's cool. So the, the last module uh, is um, uh, remote code execution. So you can execute arbitrary code remotely as system without authentication. So that's pretty cool. It exploits the same server side request forgery and also a post out arbitrary file write vulnerability, the CV 2021 27065. The options are pretty much the same. Uh, something important here, the email address you use has to be the email of an administrator for the exploit to work. Right, so it offers multiple targets and we're gonna try the first one, the PowerShell to get a meta presentation. So the, the exploit uses the first scanner model so as check method and make sure the target is vulnerable, then it exploits the server side request forgery to retrieve information such as server name, session ID, et cetera. And then it exploits the arbitrary file write vulnerability to create a .aspx web page that embeds a backdoor. This backdoor, once this backdoor is planted, the model uses it to stage the actual payload and execute it. Right, so here we have our session as a system user. So as Spencer mentioned earlier, this module actually create two sessions and this has been fixed uh, recently. So you won't see this if you use the latest version. Well, so let's try now another target. Um, for example, target number two, which will uh, execute Windows command, actually PowerShell command directly. So you don't, if you don't want to use a metapreter, for example, or you cannot use it. So the process is exactly the same. And you jump directly into a PowerShell uh, prompt. So here also we have two sessions uh, that's now fixed. There we go system. So that's pretty cool. Very, very useful modules. Indeed. Very cool. Well, that was great, Christoph. Really like seeing the modules kind of together, really showing the workflow of how an attacker might identify the vulnerability and then leverage it from start to finish. That's always really great to see. All right, um, let's see, I am up next um, with CVE 2021-1732. This is a uh, Win32K uh, local privilege escalation. Uh, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, this vulnerability was originally exploited in the wild by uh, Bitter APT in Q4 of 2020, and then Microsoft patched it in February of this year. It is a uh, data confusion vulnerability, I believe is the best way uh, to describe it in the Win32K uh, drivers on Windows. And uh, if you're uh, ready to play it. All right, so uh, we have our session here uh, running as a standard user. We're just gonna go ahead and show that we're running on, I believe this is uh, Windows 1909, though this vulnerability does affect um, up to the latest versions of Windows uh, 20H2, uh, assuming that it is missing the February 2021 patch. Uh, attempting to get system is gonna fail. So short of the uh, 
nothing up my sleeves here. Um, so this vulnerability affects Windows 1803 through 20H2, and I checked uh, each one of those builds individually. So uh, we went through, we identified the version as vulnerable, and we went ahead and tried to exploit it. Now, the first time it failed, uh, this exploit's not 100% reliable, but one of the nice things about this vulnerability is that, as you saw, um, it ran very quickly. And most importantly, um, despite this being a kernel mode code execution um, and memory corruption vulnerability, it is, it's pretty reliable. And uh, even in the case where it failed, the system did not blue screen. And that's uh, kind of due to a novel technique that the original exploit uh, authors use that was uh, discussed in the white paper of using a combination of the read and write pr uh, primitives to escalate the uh, token of uh, the target process. Uh, so, so it's a uh, Pretty, pretty, pretty reliable in the sense that it won't uh, cause any system instability if you run it a couple of times. Okay, next up is uh, Shelby Pace with the F5 I Control REST API RCE. Shelby, are you ready? I am, yeah. All right. All right, so uh, basically, so uh, this module was written by our very own Will Fu. Um, and what it does is it exploits uh, both uh, big, uh, F5 Big IQ devices and F5 big IP devices. Uh, this demo is gonna be against uh, a big IP device specifically. Um, and what it does is it simply exploits uh, server-side request forgery vulnerability in F F5's iControl uh, REST API to then generate a valid session token uh, in order to then uh, interact with a separate endpoint that you can get code execution against. And uh, you can go ahead and uh, play the demo. Okay, so first, I think I'm just gonna be slowly typing out IP addresses, <laughs> but uh, let's see, um, there are a couple of options. One being the endpoint, there are various endpoints you can use to actually generate the token. Um, you can supply an endpoint, or if you don't, I think I'll highlight it in a second. Um, if you don't, um, the module will use a, def uh, a, a, a random one from a list of endpoints that's within the module. Um, and you also need a valid admin user account to uh, exploit the SSRF vulnerability. But then uh, once you do that and generate a token, you can then get code execution as the root user on a vulnerable device. Awesome. Thank you, Shelby. And thank you, Will. Uh, Grant, you are up with the VMware uh, View Planner um, RCE. You ready? Yep, let's go. Yeah, so if you just want to play the video here. So this was a pretty simple vulnerability. Um, essentially, there was a bug within VMware vPlanner prior to, I believe, 4.6 security update number one. Um, basically, every version of VMware vPlanner 4.6 prior to that version. Um, allows for users to upload arbitrary files as an unauthenticated user. So in this case, we just utilize this vulnerability to upload a Python uh, reverse shell. So excuse the little typos here. Um, I'm just sending the R host and L host uh, parameters. Um, but essentially what we should be able to do is by abusing one of the scripts that come with the um, with the product, you can essentially upload an arbitrary file. We then backdoor that file. Um, the reason that we backdoored is that if we were to overwrite it directly, we would remove the ability to actually remove the backdoor later on. Um, so we simply just add some code to the existing file to execute a script when we send a specific request. Um, and then once that's done, then we remove the backdoor. We can also see that um, this module does have checks to see if the target file is vulnerable or if it has been patched. Um, this just allows us to see if, you know, if there's some newer version, but they haven't applied the patch, then we can determine if it's vulnerable or not. Um, the resulting code execution occurs as Apache within a Docker container. So I'm just going to show you the contents and you can see that we've got the Docker environment there to indicate that it is a Docker file um, that we are running in. So just be aware of that. Um, and you can see we're running as the Apache user. And just to double check that, uh, 
you can also see from the ID command, we're running as Apache. All right, Shelby, I think you're up with the uh, new search functionality in Metal. You ready to demo that? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so this is just a demo of um, the new search functionality that we added to Metal or the POSIX interpreter, I guess you could say. Um, uh, you can go ahead and start the video. Um, so normally this this exists, this has existed for a while in, in Windows Meterpreter, um, but we haven't had it for uh, Metal. So people who've you know gotten sessions on Linux or OS X or something like that, they haven't been able to search the file system. Um, so basically this is just going to demo um, a recursive search first um, of the data that was showed previously on the other uh, half of the screen. Um, yeah, so so there you can see search recursively, um, and this is out, but without a recursive search. And the ne next search um, is going to be using file globbing, which is actually a capability that was added to Metal um, by TimWR. Um, so so yeah, basically um, now if you need to search the file hierarchy of the system you're on, you can now do it. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty great to see the uh, feature parity there between the, the popular Linux interpreter implementation and Windows, especially given the prevalence of embedded environments that may not always have all of the same utilities and things like that. The ability to kind of like bring your tools with you kind of aids in like research capabilities and such. So thank you, Shelby. Over to the time command from Alan. Awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, this has come up a few times where uh, issues have been raised by users claiming that there's sort of like performance issues and it's been always hard to sort of gain how much of a performance issue and even whenever I was first using Metasploit for the first time and entering in invalid commands it always felt like it took quite a while but I could never really pinpoint how long things took um, so this is now just adding a user level command where you can prefix any normal Metasploit command with time uh, and then once the time completes as normal, once the command completes as normal, it'll tell you how long it took. And then we can use this as a metric for finding out which commands are really painful for our users and making improvements to them. Um, so if you jump to the next slide, I think we've got an example of it. So yeah, um, so for instance, right now in Metasploit console, uh, well, spoilers for later, uh, but previously um, it used to take about 30 seconds just to show all of the exploits within the Metasploit console. Um, and I always knew it took a while, but now I have a clear cut. Yes, it takes exactly 30 seconds. And the only difference here is just taking the original command and putting time in front of it. And that's hopefully going to guide us in a sort of instrumenting and improving the performance of Metasploit critical commands that our users are using. Um, that's me, thanks. Awesome, thank you, Alan. Uh, Christopher, are you ready with the uh, show command improvements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this would be a nice quick wee demo. Uh, we're just going to go over some of the recent performance improvements uh, made to the show commands. As you can see here, uh, the time command came in very useful for uh, working on this. Um, so we have two screenshots here. We have the top one, which was uh, prior to the improvements where uh, running the show exploits command was taken in around 30 seconds. Uh, obviously, it's the worst case because the exploits was generating the largest results back. Um, but after we made some improvements to the data mining process, uh, we have it down now to that, the, as you can see in the bottom screenshot, uh, show exploits pretty much down to instantaneous. Uh, so yeah, again, thumbs up to the time command being added. I appreciated that for this uh, ticket especially. So yeah, just a nice wee small uh, uh, performance improvement. That's across all of the uh, show command modules as well. So uh, all seven. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Christopher. All right. And that concludes the uh, framework demo. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to the Attacker KB team. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Spencer. And thank you, team, for those demos. That's great stuff. I like that Christopher's is like two orders of, of magnitude improvement, and he's called it We Small. Um, love it. Great stuff, everybody. So we'll circle over to Attacker KB, the attacker knowledge base. Um, and let's just, we'll look to Siri, has, uh, is going to show us and talk about some exploited in the wild enhancements. Um, I think in the reverse order that, um, Siri. Hi. Um, so yeah, we have some really exciting enhancements to the exploited in the wild feature. 
Um, we've added the ability where multiple users can report a CVE as exploited in the wild. Um, you can also add a lot more details to your exploited in the wild report. Instead of just checking a box, you can add um, where you where you found it exploited in the wild. You can add sources. Um, and we also display all of this information on the Vol Details tab. OK, cool. Perfect. Um, so as you can see here, um, we have multiple people who have reported this as exploited in the wild. I can also add an exploit in the wild report, which brings up this little modal. Um, and you can check where you've seen it. You can add re references. Um, so that's pretty cool. And if you want to then see everyone else's reports, you can click the little see source details. And it takes you to this new section on the Volume Details tab where it has everybody's reports. Um, this is what a report looks like right now, um, the old old way, the legacy way of doing it. And this is what a report would look like now with the sources. Um, and from here, you can, um, if you have a report, you can edit your report from the Vuln Details tab. And if you want to like add, go back and like add more, add more stuff to it. Um, so yeah, we've just up to, enhanced a lot of things, added a lot of new features, and I think it's a really cool, cool update. Um, does anybody have any questions? All right. Oh, well, that was uh, demoed locally, correct? Com coming yes. soon to the site. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Hopefully today. Hopefully. I don't want to jinx awesome. anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> there is a good question in the chat. Uh, Caitlin asked if uh, she wanted to go back and add references to the exploits that she added or that she marked as exploring the wild in the past. Will she be able to actually go and change those? Yes, definitely. So if you've ex uh, reported something as exploited in the wild in the past, you can go into the Vol Details tab and click the little edit button and you can add all this, all sorts of stuff, any, any references, any sources, all that kind of good stuff. Nice. Thank you, Siri. Um, and we'll segue over to Matthew, who's going to talk about some uh, performance improvements um, that he's recently made. Matthew? Yes. The performance changes have actually been made for a while. They finally got reviewed. Uh, so thanks to Sonny Gonzalez for spending time to do a detailed and thorough analysis. He also spent some time during his uh, review of that PR to produce uh, some metrics, which I'm presenting here. And just to talk through quickly the performance improvements and uh, what we see here. So the chart that you're seeing viewing right now, this is a metric against the changes before the performance improvements with the cache disabled um, and the cache disabled in the new, the new changes. So what you're seeing is just raw improvement of uh, request timing based on reworking server-side code uh, primarily. So there were lots of places that I discovered uh, ways that we could be doing things better, uh, maybe in some cases unnecessary requests that were being created and sort of optimized that and parallelized some of those requests um, to, to squeeze the time down even further. The home page, you'll know, probably looks still a little bit high. Um, that's because some of the requests were, the backend requests were costly. What you're not seeing here is with the cache enabled, um, that goes down to, I think Sunny's metric was 77 milliseconds uh, on the homepage. So this is a comparison of uh, before, and, before and after with no cache, with the cache enabled, we get, we squeeze it down everything, everything down further. So you get uh, sort of sub-second response times. Uh, this is all development system, so I, I expect actually the numbers to look even nicer on uh, production hardware. And uh, that's it. This is a, these are changes that have been merged. Uh, as Siri mentioned, uh, the Explode in the Wild changes are completing the last round of reviews. And the plan is to get all of this, both the Explode in the Wild and the performance improvements, deployed later this afternoon or tomorrow. So coming to live AKB near you soon. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you, Siri. Excellent.